Time now for us to hit the newspapers and social media portals, find out what exactly is going on in the news. Thank you for making the time to be with us. Uh, later or shortly, we'll actually be joined by Oliver Bakavomo. He is a member of the Fix the Country uh, group. But right before he joins us, right before he connects with us, let's get into the papers for uh, this morning, starting with the Daily Graphic newspaper. And it says, teacher unions raise red flag over new contact hours. And now that our students are back in school, I mean, and rolling forward, uh, many are concerned, especially about basic education and the entire semester system from a trimester system. You know, it got me thinking, going way back down memory lane and how we used to go to school, you know, the breaks, the midterms and all of that, even at the senior secondary level. Uh, a lot of things have changed, but we'll be discoursing on those, find out how you feel as things change. Of course, they say change is good, but is this the kind of change we want? We'll discourse on that. Don't you forget to engage us on social media as well as uh, via the phone lines when we activate them. But teacher unions raise red flag over new contact hours. That's on page uh, 13. Right after that, I'll welcome uh, Oliver Baka Vomawa. And it says four teacher unions, four of them, have called on the Ghana Education Service to withdraw the entire semester system at the pre-tertiary level for wider consultations with stakeholders before it is implemented. According to the unions, the unilateral change in the school calendar from the trimester system to the semester system to cover pupils at the primary and the kindergarten levels by the GES was arbitrary and an imposition on the major stakeholders in education of which the unions were a part. So which unions am I speaking of? The NATS, Ghana National Association of Teachers, NAGRAT's National Association of Graduate Teachers. There's also the Coalition of Concerned Teachers, Ghana, CCTGH, and the Teachers and Educational Workers Union, that is TIL. Further details on page 13 of the newspaper. Oliver, if you can hear me, uh, hello. Can you hear me, Oliver? I think I, you'd I have to unmute. Uh, yeah, I, I'm committing one of the cardinal sins of, of using uh, right. Zoom. <laughs> You've not unmuted, and you are speaking. Yes, yes. <laughs> hope you're well. I hope Oliver. you're doing well. Uh, no, no complaints. I'm fine. Yourself. We we bless the Lord uh, for another day. So I'm just going through the daily graphic, and I'll run a few things by you after putting the headlines out there. So, Dwabing Hene presides over funeral rites for Dasibre Oti uh, Boating. That is also uh, there, and then we have economic fundamentals strong. That's according to the finance. Uh, ministry. And you know, on the back of the recent downgrade by, you know, Fitch from a B to a B negative with a negative outlook. And yesterday we walked you through some of the realities when it comes to our economy, the debt to GDP ratio, uh, how our economy is performing and what we should look forward to moving on. So the, 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 the finance ministry is saying all of that notwithstanding, we're on very good footing. We have a robust economy. Uh, the likes of Professor Bokkin, uh, or Bokpin, I should say, don't subscribe to that. They feel that we're just on the very precipice of disaster. What do you think? Um, we'll be getting into that. But that's, that's the banner headline uh, there. Then there's new U.S.-Africa envoy to visit Ethiopia, Sudan, dozens killed and others kidnapped in Nigeria. On the back page, win or come home, Black Stars dilemma. And Black Stars receive $5,000 winning bonus that is if they beat Comoros to qualify for the knockout stage all right so let me pick your brains on these Oliver the first one has to do with the teacher unions raising red flags over the new contact hours so they are saying first of all there was no consultation with them on this entire enterprise uh, of, of first a trimester to a semester system the contact hours and all of that and and think of it Initially, when, when we're in school, we're doing some 12 weeks or so, then you would take a break. I mean, even at the tertiary level, I've heard argumentation that, look, even at the tertiary level, we are doing, what, 16 uh, weeks. Now, 20 weeks straight, especially for uh, ones this young, is not exactly in the best light. What do you think? Uh, you, you're deep into, <laughs> you're deep down the throat of education as well. What do you think? <laughs> No, hey, I, I, I want to avoid presuming any, um, you know, technical knowledge about, about education. What I do think in this matter is really 
one of the things which have become quick become an Achilles heel of the government has been the questions around the extent to which stakeholders are brought on board in conversation and decision making. And I'm using this as sort of uh, a reflection of what has happened in the conversations around the EDV as well, as an example. Right. Now, to the extent that I am, you know, intellectually poor when it comes to education policy making and uh, decision making around contact hours, I do think that one of the biggest constituencies one can ever go around in making this in making this decision has to be the unions, the teachers who are actually going to be part of that conversation. And what, no what, 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 was that for you? Was that for you the first failure? Not. Uh, putting out something this massive and not uh, consulting them. What, was that the first failure? No, actually. I mean, to, to this point, I have no, I've not read any policy paper or conversation that is intellectually grounded that will be subjected to some level of scrutiny by, by, you know, by intellectual public in Ghana regarding the decisions why we're making these this changes. And it seems to me that it's so quite repetitive to the extent that there's a lot of the policy making is, 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 is knee jerk rather than empirically researched and, you know, giving you a basis for why policy is changing, especially when you have a drastic and important policy change like this. There has to be some work that is done that you can refer to for, for decision makers to, to talk about. Now, yeah. I say this because I know Kofi Asari, for instance, has written on this. Uh, Kofi Asari has been quite active in education conversation in this country. And so the, the inability for our stakeholders and even people within a certain, you know, uh, policy interest in education to be able to be confronted with some well-prepared research that has been done by the government or its, or the, or its affiliates that justifies the shift in policy is where policy fails immediately. Because then you are unable to quite identify pro clearly and refine the issues. You are unable then to put in place a proper stakeholder conversation framework for making decisions around this. And I think that's, that's where I, I would come in and, and, and say that needs to be done. Uh, there's, nobody can say that there's anything, you know, uh, inherently unrealistic or bad by what the, the demands of the unions in this case, and, and asking for to be consulted and be part of the conversation and decision making around this. Mm. But let's be clear. One of the things that usually happens in this country is that the level of how government understands stakeholder consultation sometimes can also be faulty. Because it, it often deals in an approach where it calls one or two union heads who are then given you know, an opportunity to be part of some discussion and then rubber stamp the process without any broader consultations with the, with the entire union. And there's no mechanisms for filtering this down the path where you know, lower level uh, town hall meetings will be had with you know, district, the district or whatever levels that allows for this a real sense of ownership over decision making that are participated in. So just involving the unions is not even enough. The question is, to what extent and who is in the room? And how are those decisions and individual teachers feel like they're part of the decision-making? Decision uh, this is also reminiscent of, of what happened around the laptop acquisition issues, where unions, particularly sat in gov with government, and when I say unions, I mean certain leadership of, of some of the unions and teachers were completely cut out of the loop in the decision-making. So this is kind of my reflection on, on, on what this story is and one of the problems you continue to see about governance generally. So moving forward, uh, this is what the, the, the teacher unions have to say. We therefore call on, and I'm quoting them here, we therefore call on the GES to immediately withdraw the policy pending full consultations with the unions in education and other major stakeholders and do serve notice that failure to do so will be resisted fiercely. Uh, my question to you, even as they add that the policy needs to be discussed, and that uh, as well, if there's going to be any compensation to be paid to teach teachers, uh, they would have to discuss that so it would be done with their input. Do you feel that in administrating the state and across the board, in many instances, uh, we have unnecessary rancor being fueled from different ends? And this is what I mean. There's UTAG doing its own thing. There is CTAG in there. Mm. There are so many other groupings that have come up with so many other problems that they are pointing to. There is the benchmark value, Wahala, of course, the president's directive has come through, and what Guta and the AGI, the wrangling. Here we are again with more teacher unions also getting on board. What are we missing? Is it the way of proper uh, deliberation, consultation? What do you feel is the problem that is generating all of these that we are seeing? Because it's back to back to back. Yeah. 
I think generally in the industrial space, uh, actually CLOSAC, which I think is the civil service units you know, have given a notice of mm. intending to embark on a, on, on a strike. Right. Um, is that there's structural inequities linked to our pay administration structure that exists generally. Mm. And these problems continue to arise because we haven't dealt with the problem at the source. At, support, at a point, one of the ways in which in the past, if you remember, the Kufo government wanted to solve this cyclical industrial issues is to put in place the single spine salary structure. What it did was that it kind of uniformized you know, a standard for determining, you know, salaries within the public sector and left out the political class um, in terms of, you know, people at Article 71 and other holders who then were able to, you know, remove themselves from a certain, uh, how do you call it? Uh, the pay administration or pay structure that existed for everybody else and, and cut themselves sweeter deals. And obviously a lot of people are disenchanted about that. Uh, I know, for instance, when you mentioned UTAC. UTAC has talked about the fact that entry-level teachers are earning uh, roughly about 10%, I think 10 to 15% of what an MP earns. This is definitely something that, you know, it's, it's going to be a source of concern for people in, in, a, in a manner that continues to repeat itself. And when you know that when we're going into the year, the government then negotiated a 7% increase for, for persons within, within the public sector, whereas the increases for persons within that Article 71 class was double what they were earning. Obviously, it's going to, going to brew some agitation for persons who feel like they've been roughly dealt with. Mm. So the problem has to be done in a way in which everybody feels that we are all on the system on a, uh, a pay structure that makes sense and is equitable. Without that sense of equity generally across the industrial labor or labor movement chain, there's always going to be this problem. Then in addition to that, they have the problems we are dealing with now, which is a question of lack of revenue, that the government, well, to, to avoid using, Bright Simon says we shouldn't say the government is broke. Uh, because it's not a policy term, but the government, government policy making around this issue is broken and that we are definitely cash trapped. Right. So there's, we have significant difficulty in raising revenue and also showing that we have an interest in cutting down expenditure. Mm. The problem is that the ways in which we are cutting expenditure is hitting at the nerve of, you know, worker, workers in the country. You're focusing only on a particular aspect of the public sector and forgetting that when you look at the wage bill of the public sector, it's not individuals in some civil service who are earning uh, roughly 1000 1200 a month that are bloating the wage bill. Right. It's persons who are at the top who are, who, are, who are bloating the wage bill. And so these are, in, I in, think... In, in other words, you, we, you're feeding into the conversation about the, about the fact that we should be cutting down on the bigger costs at the top level because we are top heavy or maybe top small in terms of numbers, but what they get... It's very heavy. I mean, I, I know you've heard some of your compatriots talking about the fact that if we are saying we are tightening our belts, how about the free fuel some of those in the executive, legislature, and judiciary get? Can they start purchasing their fuel? Some of the perks we give them, can we start reducing them? I, are you agreeing with some of those concerns? No, I, I absolutely have to agree. I think, you know, governance and, and policy decisions, they have to be holistic. There hasn't been a sense that there's a, a holistic, uh, you know, cutting of costs within a particular class that is overburdening the, the public wage bill and also making it difficult for us to be able to raise the needed revenue to service our debt, our debt and also avoid a, a default, which we are on the, on the brink of. Uh, you, let's, let's take, for example, just something as minute. You, you, you kind of dropped in the benchmark value issues, for instance. We, well, one, we are, we, are, we, have a, we are in a country without a proper public function or a properly functioning transport system. Uh, public transport system, by which reason everybody resorts to to buying or trying to get a car in and, and all of that. And the kind of duties that people are paying there, it means that the, a lot of people are being priced out of being, of being able to own their own vehicles. In fact, the persons who are making those decisions within parliament and also within the ministries and all of that are able to import a car duty-free, right? So every point where you feel like the burden would be shared across board, right. persons within this sense write themselves out of it. Mm. You know, people are talking about complaining about fuel, you give an example, and even there's a constant increase in fuel prices, persons who are supposed to be making decisions around this are getting free fuel coupons for themselves and for the air. Uh, does, uh, does that make our families. leaders insensitive? Are they being insensitive to us? I mean, they say tighten your belts, let's tighten our belts, but then 
the idea that like the commoner feels, no, it is let's you tighten your belts, but we are not tightening ours. Is, is that the feeling? Um, I, your, 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 your last point is absolutely correct, uh, which is that, you know, that in terms of tightening of belt, we are not seeing any cuts at, at any point around the critical mass of persons who are in the political class in the country. Uh, not only Article 71 holders, but all government uh, appointees across, across board. There's, there's no tightening whatsoever. And, and so, yes, this is, I don't know whether to call it insensitivity. I, I, my, I, I, I tend what to view it more it? as a continue. I'll continue, I'll continue to view it as a continuation of an oppression we fought against. You okay. know, I go back to the national anthem where we say, to help us resist oppression or oppressive rule. This is what it is, right? Like, it's a, it's a certain class of people who are con which continues to perpetuate itself. Because why, why is it so? We're a country of limited resources. We, we have, you know, we are raising very few and we are not being smart in terms of how much we're getting from our mineral resources and all, all that. But let's put that aside. So you have a certain class of people then who are supposed to administer these limited resources for the benefit of all. Mm. They looked at the situation and decided that, okay, we know that everybody would get, say, salary or remuneration or compensation, which is not equitable. And, or it's not, when I say equitable, which is not fair in terms of the, the work they put in. Right. But we all have to tighten our belts. We say we are, we are a developing country. We can't do it all. But then they decided that, well, but we can just allow ourselves a little because we make the decisions as to what we get. Mm. And so then we can take you know, the burden off ourselves because we are the only ones who are able to make that decision without it being subject to the veto of the people generally. And so that's what they did. We put it in a framework that allows them to decide how much they pay themselves and they decide to increase it at will. Right? So when you have a situation like that, as long as they feel any pinch, they decide to add some money to themselves. Right. People come to us all the time to ask for, uh, you know, some support, family support or donations to school and all of that, which is what happens to the majority of Ghanaians every day. Even on social media today, Ghanaians from all walks of life are trying to raise money to send people to schools. Mm. But then MPs say, well, because of this, we deserve MP share of the common fund. Mm. So they give themselves a little more because... We go to funerals and we have to make donations. We right. all do. Right. But when they seize the opportunity, you know, so these are the things that are a structural and created into the system that we have to, 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 to break okay. apart. So, so speaking of the system, I'll be coming back to you on something you've been saying in recent times and find out uh, whether your thinking has changed any. But talking about students, for example, and their expenses, uh, students are scared of extra expenses for hostels, living expenses due to uh, UTAC strike. That's the Finder newspaper. GRA rakes in 57.32 billion Ghana cities, exceeds target uh, by 265.39 million. And uh, that is something that the GRA has been touting, and rightly so. We've always had our concerns with tax uh, generation. Odo Tobri Rural Bank grants scholarships to 59 students. And withdrawal of Bagbin's uh, military detail, not politically motivated. That's according to the majority. Coming back to you, uh, Oliver, I know in recent times, I mean, on news file with uh, Samsaladi Anyanini and all that, you were talking about our constitution and the relevance of it. Right before that, we had had the Constitution Day series and the lectures at the UPSA. And Senor Hossi had intimated that our constitution, in terms of relevance, in terms of age, is basically uh, nearing death. It's on its last legs. Is that talking about all this bit about the system, our institutions and the flaws, uh, is that something you agree with and to what extent? You know, one, I, I agree with this uh, largely, but I also want to expand it. Uh, I want to expand it. Sometimes when we talk about the constitution, we focus too narrowly on the text of the constitution and forget that the constitution is also made up of its constitutional practice. Right. And what has become, you know, also what has become settled law that the judiciary is involved in or settled practices. It's a whole industry around the constitution and constitutional decision making and also the practices that is engendered, which has failed, which has allowed inequity to, to, to become a part of the big culture. And that's why a lot of times when you talk about the constitution has failed, people say, but we can just amend something little here and, and then we're good to go. But it is failing to grasp the fact that a constitutional document, text of a document, is only half of the story. It's the whole practices that are around that constitution that, the cons that particular constitution enables. Mm. An example is the kind of parliament we have had 
you know, since 1992 till now, it's been a parliament that is used to minority will have their say, majority will have their way. Because of this, there's not been a development of a culture around consensus building and decision making collectively. And the failure of that or the absence of that culture is now on display when you have a different parliament for the first time, mm. which is a, a hung parliament. So because of the, we are unable to make decisions, like constantly today, you see the minority and majority attacking themselves and the speaker constantly on issues that are so basic and minute that in fact hamper the ability to build consensus and drive decision making together. These are things that have all collectively failed. But beyond the, the way in which we govern and decision making as well, yeah, there are issues around equity in terms of governing and how we govern in terms of ensuring the ensuring that the, the, what we call the national cake is divided in a way that is fair to everybody, that the constitutional text itself doesn't make it feasible for it to, to happen in a proper way. Right. Uh, let me give an example, for instance. In terms of, let's say, decentralization. And, and, and please make that a short one so we can feed in, because there are many other matters to discuss on, even on the Constitution. Okay. Uh, so we have, so we have the Constitution there is about, I think, 10% uh, of, 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 of consolidated fund needs to be given to the districts. And not only do we not do that, we, we, the money that is supposed to give to them, what we do is that we recenter it back at the center and then procurement decisions around what kind of paper district assemblies are supposed to use, letterheads and all of that, we procure them at the national level again. Mm. If development is local, as we say, the framework has to be reversed, such that 65 or 70% of revenue raised must all go to the districts. That only 30% is retained at the national level. And these are questions that allow for those who are DCs and others to be much more involved in decision making, developmental decision making at the local level, ensures that you know, your road is fixed and things like that, uh, generally. Right. This might be of interest to you uh, as we move on. MPs on public boards is breach of 1992 constitution, and that is in the Ghanaian Times newspaper, specifically mm -hmm. on page 11. It says, Clara Bieri Kasati, law lecturer at the University of Ghana Law School, has stated that the appointment of members of parliament uh, to boards of state-owned enterprises is a breach of Article 982 of the 1992 Constitution. Mrs. Cassidy explained that the act by governments was wrong since the provision stipulates that, and I quote, an MP shall not hold any office or profit or emolument, whether private or public, and either directly or indirectly, unless permitted to do so by the Speaker acting on the recommendations of a committee of parliament. It would be interesting, wouldn't it, uh, to find out how many of these on which boards actually have the support of the speaker, <laughs> Oliver. So that's no. That's I have written on this actually. <laughs> I've written on this actually that it upsets even the whole idea of a of a of a separation of powers, and I completely agree with Clara. It's something that I hope it's, it's tested in the Supreme Court. I, like many people, have lost a little faith in the Supreme Court's ability to, to, to decide these bigger issues that set our democracy right. Why, why exactly? I do hope that, why exactly? Why well, we have we example. We that? have example, right? In, in Domenovo, for instance, the court, when it was challenged as to the president asking him to go on leave, it's been two years. That matter has not even been heard by the court, mm. and that the gentleman himself has now been shown the door. So that's an example of the court not being willing to, to take this grand. So you think there's politics at play? I think there's a politics at play. And, 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 and to say something that I've heard in confidence, understand that when the action was even filed, a certain judge of the Supreme Court went on and told certain people that, you know, this, the elections are coming up and we are, there's no way we are going to determine this matter now. Mm. I do not think that the Supreme Court has to be sensitive to the electoral calendar. It is not their job to determine how matters like this affect our elections. Right. Once they, they have that consideration, you know that our, our, our judiciary has failed. And so I have, I have zero trust that they will be able to set this right. And so maybe some other people do and might be able to take the, the issue up. All right. Let's quickly look at uh, the Daily Guide newspaper. And there is, uh, after Forsen trial begins today, Opuni trial adjourned to 31st of January. Customs officers use uh, Captain Smart for 100 million Ghana cities. And Okwe, I'm talking about, about former uh, Right Honorable Speaker, uh, Mike, Professor Mike. Aaron Okwe denies soldiers' protection. That's what he's saying, that at no point did he ever have uh, the protection of soldiers. Uh, that's it for the Daily Guide newspaper. Uh, let's see whether the international page will give us some inter interesting highlights. Uh, there's also, if you are... <laughs>
when I pronounce this name, I don't know whether to do it there. But if you Schwarzenegger's uh, dad dies, of course, that's not, not how the name is pronounced properly. Kim Kardashian allegedly prevented Kanye from attending daughter's birthday. And Moisha, our very own Moisha Budwong, extols God as she returns to social media. That's it for the Daily Guide uh, newspaper. Something, though, that has been trending that I'd like to pick your thoughts on, I don't want to uh, miss it right before I get to the business papers. It has to do with some textbooks. Uh, have you seen any shots of them? Some textbooks out there. And uh, even as we talk education today, textbooks that give a feel of quite a bit of a politicization of our history, as some people uh, put it. What do you feel those actions of today will have on the generations of tomorrow? And this is why I am asking that question. I have lived in Cuba, a country where, and, and they, they say it unashamedly, I am not saying it, they, they, they admit that unashamedly teaches you or serves you a meal of propaganda right from infancy. And that they tell you this, we are socialists, uh, we have a nationalistic reason for doing this. Of course, you know of the American embargo and all of that. Uh, the only thing we can bequeath to future generations is the right learning, the right teaching. And if this is what we are giving them, supposedly approved by, uh, you know, our curriculum establishment, NACA, then are we just serving them a, a, a political overdose that will give them a political hangover in, in future? Your take. Um, I, I think one of the things we can admit is that teaching and history itself is very, very politicized. And we can give you go back to this. What, teaching in Ghana? Yes, teaching and No, across board, generally. Okay. Uh, the teaching itself is a very political choice. What we choose to teach and what we decide to leave out are all decisions we make in terms of what, we, what agenda and what you know, young people we are trying to form out and what vision we want them to have of their, their society. One of the original myths of this country is, for instance, even the big sis, right? It created this myth that these six people were the forefront of Ghana's fight for, for independence. But in fact, it, it's not true. And it cuts out, first of all, several women who, who were in the fight for, for, for independence and supported the march for independence. Right. That we have this image that our independence was fought for by only men. That's one of the original myths in this country. And we're seeing... Evidences of this come back again, this around the myth of the big sis, come back particularly strong in this, in, in, in this era where, you know, the government has changed the idea of the Founders Day into fun, Founders and, and, and then, you know, remove the Republic Day and made it Constitution Day. So there's a, and then, you know, change the names of several institutions where people feel like there's a real historical project to elevate a particular, you know, persons in our history or particular political tradition uh, in a way that is imprinted onto the minds of young, young children we are raising in this country. And I think that those sentiments, there's always a lot of controversy around, um, mm. you know. And I think that's what is happening. I, I kind of want to avoid going to people's rationale of wanting to do this. But I think that everybody in this country well, must understand that these are political decisions that are being made and for a political purpose. Right. Uh, of, of seven, of seven, the, the, very you know, briefly, seven what do you think, uh, for example, does that mean our institutions themselves, I mean... Uh, are, are getting compromised in terms of, uh, l let me just get the full name, the National Council for Curriculum and Assessment, for example, if, if indeed we are allowing some of these things together. And what do you think could be the consequences uh, moving forward on our education? Because education will feed into our leadership. And so what kind of leadership then are we preparing for the future? Very briefly on that. So you, you talked about the, the, those who are preparing a curriculum. Um, it's 100% of them who are appointed by by the president, all of them political, presidential and political appointees. Uh, these are persons who are political affiliates, who are mm. supposed to be, so it's not even an infiltration or any sort, anything like that, but these are politicians making those decisions on our behalf. And, and by God, all I know politicians to do is to continue to secure for themselves a political advantage, even in an area as minute of how we raise our two children to say A, B, C, D. Mm. All right, uh, IGP petitioned over murder of Ahmed Hussein Swale. You know, the 16th actually marked, the 16th of this month marked three years since his unfortunate and untimely demise, his uh, passing. Uh, so that story there as well. Quick reaction, or should I move on, Oliver? No, I'll, I'll, I, I want to reserve a bit of time because I want to talk about the, the Baguian bad bad and military issue. So then then bit, let's, so let's get right into it, because the Daily Statesman newspaper from which I took that story also has the bid about 12 police officers for Bagmin. It is the highest ever for a speaker. That's according to the majority caucus. So your brief take. 
Yeah, so first of all, one, I think one of the things we have to understand about Bagwin is that his interest is to create a certain level of parity between the arms of government. Mm. And that his sense is that, you know, over, over years we've made the executive arm too strong in terms of what they are given and facilities and all of that, that there has to be some attempt to balance the scale. Now, whether you can agree or disagree with it or not, you have to understand where his thinking comes from. My biggest concern, though, is this sense of continuous militarization of the political class, where the military has now become, you know, some part of private militia for persons within, uh, you know, the political appointees and these persons within this class. The military has and, become a private militia? Yes. So for as long as in our history and in other democracies, the military do not serve as bodyguard to politicians. In no established democracy does this happen. Mm. In fact, in, in Ghana for a very long time, when the governor was here in Kuma as prime minister, the security provided to them were by police officers and special units of the police, police only. The only times military started coming in was after the several assassination attempts on Nkrumah's life that he created the president's own regiment, guard, president's guard, own guard regiment. Mm. And where, you know, persons within the military who were deemed unfit for service were then incorporated into that protection. And then since then, the Fourth Republic now has made it so widespread that everybody, you saw Jean Mensah having military officers guarding her, you saw the yeah. deputy attorney general, somebody holding his a police military person holding his back. It's just a cross board. And this is my biggest worry. I think it's the, one of the biggest threats to our democracy. Because okay. one, it creates a situation whereby you have the military able to in pro, close proximity with democratic actors. Mm then allow the military to be able to build intelligence on these persons, their ways of life and the things they do, and put the, a better organized military in a, in a situation to easily take over the state. Mm. Secondly, in a democracy, a democracy that has held that the celebration of the 31st December, uh, the 31st December coup is even unconstitutional, to have the face of leadership so intertwined with military that every time you see a democratic leader, there must be a military person behind their back. That's, it's inconsistent with the spirit of the 1992 Constitution. Right. We do not want to see the military so involved in, 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 in how we govern in a democracy. And these are things that I think we have to pay particular attention to, right. uh, even though we are, if not, we are putting the state in jeopardy. And let's not forget that at the dawn of the 8th Parliament, we had the military, so to speak, stampede uh, Parliament, upon whose orders Absolutely. we still don't really uh, no, but very important point you make there. Uh, the BNFT uh, today, the only story I'll highlight, 2021 revised economic growth target achievable. That's according to analysts. Right before you take leave of us, uh, Oliver, uh, I can't let you go without talking about the black stars of Ghana. And I know you firmly support <laughs> us, uh, and you are not with the Moroccans. <laughs> That's just on the lighter <laughs> side. But uh, here we are, uh, two matches, only one point to show. And today is uh, deal, you know, deal day, make or break. It's either we thrash the Comoros or we are sent packing. There's a $5,000 package for each player and the team if they sail through or if they pull through. Your take and your prediction ahead of today's match. I, I, I saw some take which said that since John Boy kissed that money at the World Cup, <laughs> Ghana has never been the same. I, listen, <laughs> I, I, I hope we're able to beat Comoros. I, 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 I would go with, first of all, my prediction, I think I'll go with 2 0 if it were the Black Stars. Uh, because it's sufficient enough if, there's, you know, uh, if, the, if, if, if Gabon loses for us to be able to sail through. Um, as to whether or not the Black Star is able to do it, you remember when, I think, when was it? When we were supposed to beat Zimbabwe, and that was what we needed to qualify at the AFCON, and then we went and lost 1-0 to them. Right. And I'm hoping that the ghosts of, of times past do not repeat themselves and show their head. Mm. But I, I am trusting that the Black Stars have been enough fear of us Ghanaians, even if the love of the money they are being promised is not enough, that they have enough fear of our voices, critical voices across board, that it puts some fire into them to, to, to discipline Comoros, who are, I think, yet to win a match at... at uh, or even draw, I think, uh, right. at, at the AFCON. <laughs> Oliver, always great catching up with you. Thank you so much for making time for us today. I appreciate you. Thank you as well. All right. Have a good one. Oliver Baka Vomawo. He is a member of uh, the hashtag Fix the Country uh, group. As we wrap, I'd also like to just wish the very best to three of my colleagues. Uh, there's Gladys Oredu. Today happens to be your birthday. You're with the team. You're a wonderful person. Happy birthday to you. Same to Ibrahim Ben Bakon. Ivy, 
uh, for short. Happy birthday to you as well. And it's interesting because all three of you, Miriam Awojifa Vojogbe, today happens to be your birthday as well. Mims, have a wonderful day. Well, that's how we draw uh, the curtains on the news review. Up next, we have sports.